Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to our talk. We're going to be talking about how to look below the noise floor with a technique called lock-in amplification and how you can do it with just some DSP and an oscilloscope or any kind of ADC, really, that you already have. So the magic of this technique is taking a noisy signal, just rejecting all the noise, and getting just the part you want, just the signal that you're interested in. Of course, there's some caveats, but it is a very powerful technique for measuring how a signal flows through a system. So we've all probably tried to measure something and got a result that looked more like that when you were expecting something that looked more like that. Um, and we're going to tell you how you can turn the noise into the signal. So a lock-in amplifier is a, a great way to do this. It is a way to, to lock into those very small signals that can be swamped out by noise and interference and actually measure, measure signals that are well below the noise floor with a negative signal-to-noise ratio. Um, and, and essentially, what a lock-in amplifier is, is an ultra-narrow bandpass filter. How do you actually implement that? Mark's going to tell you later. But we'll just kind of go through a, a simple example of how this might be used. So imagine measuring a sound. You've got a microphone, you've got a speaker, and the speaker puts out a noise, and the microphone picks it up. And nothing else, right? Nothing else comes into that microphone because you're in a, in a perfect world with spherical cows and an anechoic chamber and, and no interference at all, um, except that that's probably not true. You're in a world with other things in it, like noisy kids and cars and people doing construction. And uh, that stuff can actually be a lot louder than the signal you're trying to measure. It could be tens or hundred decibels louder. Um, and if you want to get rid of that, what you might do is use a lock-in amplifier to reject all that external noise and focus in just on the sound coming out of a speaker. Um, so that's kind of a neat demo, and it's one we're going to give up here, but there are other actual real-world applications that it's uh, used in, lock-in amplification is used in. I'm going to talk about a couple of those. One thing you might use it for is making an ultra-sensitive load cell that rejects a lot of noise. So if you wanted to measure uh, a load cell with a Wheatstone bridge circuit, you apply a voltage across one thing and then measure the output voltage between there. And you'll get some noise from EM interference, from thermal noise in the resistors. And one way you can reject that is with a lock-in amplifier. Normally, you would apply DC across it and measure the DC across the output. But uh, to make lock-in amplification work, you need an AC signal. So you can just apply an AC signal, measure it. Um, and when you apply it at a particular known frequency, and this is kind of key to how it works, you can reject everything except the signal at that particular frequency that you applied with such a narrow filter that you essentially reject all the noise. Um, another thing this is used for is localizing catheters. So in heart surgery, a, a catheter will be inserted into the heart for mapping, and in order to build an accurate map of the inside of the heart, you have to know exactly where the tip of that catheter is. The catheter has magnetic coils inside the tip, it sits in an external magnetic field produced by a patient coil with multiple frequencies going at once coming from different places and it uses a similar technique in DSP usually to um, measure the ratio of those signals being received in each of the coils and that can figure out the position and orientation because there are multiple coils in the tip of the catheter and it's, it's a really important part of heart surgery. So. This is actually a technique used in, in commercial products. So lo login amplifiers have a lot of applications. A similar thing to how that catheter localization works can be used for 3D touch, um, doing ultra-high and low resistance measurements, and, and the load cells and catheter localizations. And think about, you know, if you haven't heard of this technique before, is there any application that you've worked on that this might be useful for? I hope there is. How does it get done? In our case, DSP magic. Mark is going to explain it. All right, so my favorite thing to do with DSP is perform magic tricks, so let's do some today. So first we're going to talk about the how. So we have a signal of interest, right? Let's imagine we have a one microvolt signal. It's great, very large, perfect. We have 30 microvolts of noise, RMS, across the whole spectrum. How do we, how do we measure our signal? 
All I got to do, get rid of the noise. How do we get rid of noise? Filtering. We just got to filter out our signal. Easy peasy, right? Now, all we have, 0.1 microvolt of noise. Great signal noise ratio, 10 to 1. Plenty for all kinds of measurements. And so that requires reducing it by a factor of 300. That doesn't sound too bad, right? Well, so how good a filter do we need to filter this by 300x? To get a reduction, a reduction of x in noise voltage, we need a reduction in x squared in bandwidth. So noise is measured as power per hertz. You know, you might you might see it as milliwatts per uh, milliwatts per hertz th th units like that. But we want the voltage to reduce by x. We don't really care about the power when we're doing these measurements. So power is is voltage squared. That's how we get this square term. So that means to reduce the voltage noise by 300x, we need to reduce the bandwidth by 90,000 times. That's fine. I've built filters before. How do we ca measure this? We use something called the Q factor. So a Q factor is defined as the center frequency divided by the filter width. This is a figure of merit that we use when we're designing bandpass filters. How hard this filter is to design. So if we need a width 1 90,000th of the original at half our frequency, say, that means we need a Q factor of 45,000. No problem. I got plenty of components. We need a 50,000 pole Butterworth filter. We need an 8,000 pole Chevy Show filter. Or we can use an 80 pole crappy electric, elliptic filter. So it turns out uh, practical filters, you can't really build practical filters with Q above 100. Maybe if you do really good, you can get 1,000. You only need to do 45 times better than that. So how do we solve this problem? We use lock-in amplification. So we've got two steps, really easy. First, we shift the signal all the way down to zero hertz. Then we average. And the reason we do this is because a Q factor of a, the Q factor of a filter at DC is zero. It is really, really easy, the best filter that you can make. So first, we've got to shift it down to zero hertz. How do we do that? High school trig. Who remembers high school trig? Yeah. All right, perfect. Who can say the expansion of this? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> so the expansion turns out to be one half sine of x plus y plus one half sine of x minus y. We get this effect. The signal splits in two. A little bit goes up, a little bit goes down. That's how we get all the great harmonics that people use to transmit signals out of band. So when we take this, something really magical happens. If x equals y, we get some terms to cancel. We get these two parts. We get one part twice the frequency. That part we can get rid of. We get another very interesting term. We get a part where they cancel. We get a DC component. So this is how we can actually shift our signal all the way to DC. All we got to do is get rid of this annoying other part of our signal. So now some of you are like, well, what about the phase? What if things cancel? What if it's all the same? So turns out we can represent our signal as a phaser. Ooh, we got some images swapped. Um, so no, not this. This was a picture of a TNG phaser, my favorite phaser. It actually looks like this. So our original signal, it's a vector. Uh, if we multiply by sine, turns out we're actually measuring the vertical component of this vector. If we multiply by cosine, we're actually measuring the horizontal component of this vector. And so we call the cosine part of this the I part, the in phase part, or the X. And we call the sine part of this the Q, the quadrature part, or the Y component of our signal. So all we got to do, calculate the amplitude, I squared plus Q squared, square root of that, and the phase. We just got to measure the angle between here and our axis. Boom. So then we just got to average. So the longer we average for, the narrower our filter. If we average for one-tenth of a second, turns out, 10 hertz filter, average one second, one hertz filter, etc. If we have one megahertz of bandwidth, like on our original example, we consider that as one megahertz span, we only need to average for a tenth of a second to get uh, as narrow a filter as we need in our original example. So I'll add some caveats to averaging. Turns out in the spectral domain, absolutely worst filter shape you can imagine. Terrible rejection, lots of lobes. In, in the real world, we like to design better filters, but uh, it's, it's hard to do better than this with a real filter versus the time. So this is our final system. Got an input, multiplied by sine, multiplied by cosine. We get some IQ components, low pass those, get rid of our squared terms, and do the math. Well, there, there's a hidden extra part. You, you guys were all waiting, what's the catch? What's going on? 
So there's a reference signal. That's, that's a very important part of this. Turns out it only works if our frequency is exactly the same. If we're off a little bit, things don't cancel nicely. The math does not work out. So we have to have this loopback part. The input to our signal needs to be modulated with the reference input. So the input and our measurement share a little bit of information. That's actually why this magic DSP works, is because of that shared information. So what happens if we have a DC signal? Lots of signals are DC. We'd love to measure noisy ones. So it turns out we can just modulate the frequency of the signal to shift it up, should make our DC into AC. And the, so one example of this is in optics, we would use something called an optical chopper. It's got lots of little windows and not windows. We spin it around really fast. We turn our signal on and off, boom, DC to AC, easy. So now we'll talk about the practical options. How do we actually do this? So it's, it's done, there are a couple of ways. You can do a commercial locket amplifier. They're really expensive. You can do a, a DIY discrete analog design, or you can do it in DSP. All you need is an ADC, like the one in your oscilloscope. So commercial specs, um, uh, some of you may have heard of Stanford Research Systems. They're very famous for building very high performance pieces of equipment. The cheapest units start at three grand. Nice ones are like 10 grand, really expensive. There are some dev boards for the AD630, which is a synchronous demodulation chip. They don't perform that well, but they are available for much cheaper than that. You can make analog and discrete. So last, last year, James and I made an uh, open source lock and amplifier using all analog components. It has pretty good performance, not as good as a Stanford system, but probably better than most oscilloscopes can achieve. Uh, unfortunately, it's chock full of analog devices parts. It costs like $500. Um, so not as cheap as we hope it could be. If we do it with an oscilloscope or any ADC, we can actually do this all in software. So the better the ADC, the better results. You've got better bed depth, better sampling rate, uh, better buffer depth, uh, the better performance you can get. We digitize two, sig two channels, one reference, one input, and we, use, we do a bunch of magic on them. The nice thing about these is lots of people doing electronics, this is a basic tool that they already have. This isn't an additional, highly specialized, application-specific tool that you have to buy. There are some notes on the trade-offs when you use an oscilloscope, because oscilloscopes are doing this all in software, so we rely heavily on the ADC. We don't get any analog help. So the averaging is limited to the memory depth of your oscilloscope. In our implementation, extending that turns out to be really tricky. Uh, the noise floor of the system is absolutely limited by the quantization noise. Most systems are not quantization noise limited. Most of them are crappier. Uh, so and analog front ends for oscilloscopes are not necessarily designed to be spectrally pure, ultra-low noise. So you get a noise reduction proportional to the square root of the number of cycles. Some of you may know that if you, you can reduce noise by averaging and you get a square root effect, it's the same idea. Uh, you want to keep, you generally want to keep the input at about four points per sample at, at or below half Nyquist. Things get squirrely as you move higher. So that means we can reduce by square root of n over two. We have n points of scope, memory in our scope. So a TAS 1054Z, you can get about a 1700x reduction in noise using the full memory depth of this. You can get some really good performance for lots of applications. Now we're going to show you, uh, talk about a demo. So one thing we can do is we do some microphone and a speaker. And if we adjust the distance between the microphone and the speaker, and we look at the phase response of our system, we can measure the speed of sound. So this demo was shamelessly ripped from Sharyar, the signal path, who has lots of great oscilloscope content. Um, and so if we do 8.5 centimeters at one kilohertz, we should get a 90 degree phase shift if the speed of sound in this room is the same it is everywhere else. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. And uh, you can go look. So our code is on GitHub for the tool that we're about to show you. It's testing and works with the 1054Z. It also works with the PicoScope. It was so easy to add support for other instruments. James did it yesterday during batch hacking. Uh, so let us know what you think. I'll hand over to James for the demo here. All right. We've got it mostly set up here, so I'm just going to pull up our software that we wrote. And, and this is what the GitHub link is to. The uh, PicoScope API is currently closed source, but hopefully we're going to fix that next week. Um, Mark's going to talk. And while we get set up, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yep. 
Yeah, so that's a good question. So the reference needs to be locked to our signal very accurately. Uh, so the question was, are our reference signals to be locked to our signal very accurately? How do we achieve that in this setup? So we actually digitize both channels. We digitize the reference channel and we digitize the input channel. And that's how we get carefully phase synchronized input to our DSP. Yeah, so the, the trick that you have to use for locking amplifiers is the modulation for your measurement needs to be provided by the reference signal. That's the, uh, that's the caveat. That's the catch. All right, so we have our, our, our GUI here, which supports multiple, uh, multiple different instruments and it should be designed to be really easy to add support for arbitrary instrumentation and so it lets you change some settings so the first one that's important is the bandwidth of your system how much bandwidth are we measuring how narrow a lock-in filter do we need the next one is the order of the filter how sharp do we want that roll-off to be and the last one is the averaging length so in our system we average for a good period of time to get a really clean measurement yeah so the after we get it all set up here, we can go to our, our view and we can get two plots, our amplitude and our phase versus time. So if I go ahead and click run here. So, yeah, so you can see our signal right here is around one and a half millivolts. The axes are a little deceiving because they're narrow. Um, and uh, our phase lock on is not so good right now. Oh, there we go. Oh, we're moving it, I see. So if we hold it steady, you can see that the phase is very, very flat. Um, so I want to ask everybody who remembers how many centimeters I said in the presentation. Ooh, wow. I was not so surprised you were actually remembered. All right. So if we move it 8.5 centimeters, we'll see how many degrees it moves. 8.5 millimeters. Oh, all right. 10x. All right, so you can see from measuring a 10 millivolt signal, or a 25 millivolt signal to a 10 millivolt signal, and we saw a phase shift here. Did you move it the distance? Yes. We saw a phase shift here from 300, uh oh, where are my axes? From 350 degrees to 109 degrees, which is how many degrees? Yeah, 180 degrees. Yes, that was the number we were looking for. So you see here, if we clear the axes, we can see we're locked onto a signal that's now, instead of 30 millivolts, we're now locked onto a signal that's a little bit under 300 microvolts, and we still have, uh, sometimes it can take a little bit of tweaking to get the settings just right. Um, so you can see we're at 800 microvolts here. And you see, we, made, we moved our shift phase back around to the same amount. So. Let's get a round of applause to interfere with this thing, specifically. <laughs> see. There you go. Best part of the demo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any more questions before we wrap up? All right, thank you, everyone.